Hello, everybody. This is Kevin Witham, and welcome to Season 2 of the Common Ground Unity Podcast. In this season, we want to focus on practical discussions about unity within the Stone Campbell movement and beyond. Jesus valued unity and prayed for it, that we may all be one so that the world may know. We believe unity is best achieved through relationships rather than beginning with disagreements over doctrine, practice, or ideology. We value the gathering, breaking bread and sharing a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage. We invite you to gather with another Christian outside your particular family of churches and tell others that unity starts with a cup of coffee. So grab a cup and let's get started with another episode of the Common Ground Unity Podcast. Welcome once again to Common Ground Unity, to another podcast. Our goal on Common Ground Unity is to try to uh, develop opportunities for discussion and dialogue that will contribute to our maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And where that unity has suffered or been lost, to, to build bridges back to one another. So we have uh, interesting discussions with uh, people in the various streams of our Stone Campbell Restoration Movement, and uh, sometimes those guests are from Churches of Christ, sometimes Christian churches, sometimes international churches of Christ, and then all the various tributaries. Last week, we had a great discussion with Dr. Andrew Boacci. Uh, Dr. Boacci is a historian. He is a lecturer in religions and theology at the University of Manchester. As I said last week, he holds a BA in theology and M.A. in Biblical Studies, and a Ph.D. in New Testament Criticism from the University of Manchester. And he has a number of areas that he explores and specializes in uh, that we discussed last week. Uh, He wrote a book that we're going to talk about uh, in just a couple of moments, but let me also say he's married uh, to Chi. uh, They have two kids together. Uh, He also has interests outside of lecturing and teaching and researching. He works out. He's a gym addict. He's a former rugby player, a connoisseur of obscure hip-hop music. We should probably explore that in a later podcast. You all might share that, right, Kevin? uh, You probably could get some (laughs) tips from each other. (laughs) Absolutely. So uh, Andy's got an interesting life. Love to explore more of that with him and just kind of have an enjoyable conversation. But we've got some specific things to talk about here today at I'm here with my co-host, Tina Bruner. Um, Tina, why don't you uh, take it from there and introduce our conversation with uh, Andy for today. Good to, good to be back with you. Yeah, it's great. And I'm super excited about this episode of our podcast and uh, the place that we are in the series with deconstructing and reconstructing. And one thing that Andy said last week that I definitely like better than deconstructing is rethinking and deepening. So I'm going to call this series Rethinking and Deepening and Reconstruction. <laughs> so uh, in, in light of your book, Rethinking Galatians, Paul's vision of oneness in the living Christ, will you share with us what the big ideas are in, in this book and help us understand how unity and oneness relates to the book of Galatians? Yeah, I mean... I'm certainly not the first person to rethink Galatians. It's been going on for a long time. Um, I think what's happened particularly with Galatians and Romans, two of the perhaps more talked about letters of Paul, is that there have been a number of camps who have kind of claimed Galatians. And those camps sometimes don't communicate very well. And so... Galatians has to be about these very specific things. Um, And so right back from when Martin Luther was reacting to uh, sort of difficulties he had within Roman Catholicism, um, we've we've, we've kind of adopted this notion that, that Galatians is all about justification by faith. And what does that mean? Well, it's all about how do sinners find a gracious God? 
uh, and, and and then we had the sort of reaction to that in the 70s with the work of people like Krista Stondahl and Ed Sanders. And, and then we have these two camps. So there's either the sort of Lutheran camp or there's this other camp where Ed Sanders and James Dunn and Tom Wright and others are in called The New Perspective on Paul. And it's almost as if in Pauline studies, you, you have to sort of pick a side. You're, 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 you're either defending Luther or you're in some sense attacking him uh, or you think of Paul purely as an apocalyptic thinker or you, you, you think of Paul as someone who was trying to teach participation in Christ. And I, I would say that we can, we can take something from, from all the camps um, and sometimes it helps, I think, just to think about the big ideas. Now, as an academic, obviously, you want to get into the detail. And, and certainly, you know, I've spent some time trying to get into the detail of, of, of Galatians. But I see unity not just as a big idea in Galatians. I often see unity as a big idea in, in Paul. Um, probably his most central concern was here he was, this this former Pharisee, this card-carrying Jewish man, and Paul remained Jewish for his entire life. This business of quote unquote converting to Christianity is a bit anachronistic and a bit inaccurate, but we can we can maybe veer off into that. Um but how then does this person who has treasured the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, who has based his whole life on on what he thought was his service to God, which included harassing the early Jesus movement. And then he has this remarkable encounter and effectively has to reconfigure his entire life. Now he considers himself personally called to bring non-Jewish people into this thoroughly Jewish messianic sect. And that was bound to bring up all kinds of difficulties, some of which are reflected in Galatians and Romans and elsewhere in Paul, for that matter. Um, and so in rethinking Galatians, I'm trying to ask what are some of the big questions? And it seems to me that the, the, the place of the risen Christ is, is, for me, and certainly in my research, has been a huge area in Galatians, and I've managed to persuade a few New Testament scholars that that's, that's actually the case, but it was virtually, it, it, it hadn't really been treated. The, the resurrection's only specifically mentioned once in Galatians, it's in the opening line, and even then it's as a title for God, God is the one having raised Jesus from the dead. It's never mentioned again, and so scholars have said, well, there's clearly no argument here, Galatians isn't really centred upon the resurrection, whereas I would say that the life emerging from death imagery is so prevalent in Galatians, it's absolutely central. But then the other thing is, is unity. It's not just about unity between Jew and Gentile. It's unity between different kinds of Jews. It's unity between human beings and God. And so it happens at, at all levels in Galatians. Paul was, was uh, you know, as, as, a, as, as, a, as a Jewish Christian, was part of a, a much broader project, which was saying, well, how... How is, is, is God creating a human family of people who, for every other reason, are completely disparate and disconnected? You know, rich folk from the empire and poor folk from the empire. He says in 1 Corinthians one twenty six, some of you may have come from noble birth, others, others of you didn't. Paul may have had some rhetorical education or certain levels of education. Most people in the church probably couldn't read. You know, there were some people who were from Jewish backgrounds, by the end of the first century, certainly the middle of the second, the movement was largely Gentile. So this 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 family that he he's he's building around this notion of the risen Jesus is, is much like it is today. It's a very diverse fa family, and so just like members of your own physical family, you may all have their own idiosyncrasies and all be a bit different. And some like watching these kind of movies and some like what eating these kind of foods. But you still live under the same roof and you, you generally love each other and, and you get on. Well, that was Paul's vision as it was. Of course, he inherited that vision from Jesus. That was Jesus's vision for what his people should be. We see it in that wonderful 
um, uh, um, section in Galatians where this multitude is, is worshipping and it's people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation bowed before the Lamb. That's Jesus's ultimate vision for family. And that, that doesn't come easy. That comes, that's, that, that requires some work. And I think what you see in Galatians is an element of how, of just how socially and emotionally challenging that work really could be. And that's what I was trying to rethink. And so, yeah, it was trying to, to come up with the, the, the bigger, broader questions. Uh, and then we can sort of, you know, argue about the details, so to speak. Uh, I'm always interested in the background to books. By the way, we I didn't mention the title in my introduction, and I want to do that for our listeners, because um, I think a lot of folks will be kind of stimulated to buy the book and would be interested in in the things that you're sharing. The book is Rethinking Galatians, Paul's Vision of Oneness in the Living Christ. You co-authored it with uh, Peter Oaks. It's uh, published by TNT Clark. So for those that want to get a copy, you can get it on Amazon and uh, read uh, the thoughts that that Andy's developed here along with his co-author. What what led you to write the book? What 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 led you to say, boy, this is so uh, important and passionate about this. Let, let's put some things down on paper and and produce something. Yeah, well, both myself and uh, Peter Oakes, who was actually my former doctoral supervisor, um, had both written recently on on Galatians. He'd written the commentary in the Paideia series very, very prestigious uh, commentary series. Uh, and I had written a monograph called Death and Life, which was all about um, a resurrection imagery in Galatians. So we'd both written about it, but we, we both sort of came at Galatians very differently. Uh, but because there are certain things which we agreed on and certain things we really didn't agree on, we thought let's sort of spar a bit and uh, put our sort of uh, our agreements and disagreements together and kind of see what can what can come out of that and this this book was was kind of the was kind of the project but but I suppose my my sort of personal passion about it was to try to get to grips with how you have these grandiose ideas about what Paul um, thinks God is doing through Jesus on the one hand but then these very human social problems, on the other, this is what I often call just sort of Christianity on the ground. So at a ground level, you've got these rogue teachers in the church who are trying to bully Gentiles into adopting Jewish culture. Um, and uh, this kind of, it, it led to a this, this terrible showdown in Antioch that we read about in Galatians 2, where... Uh, Peter sort of drifts away from a mixed fellowship table, encourages others to do so, other Jewish believers. Paul calls out his friend Barnabas. He says, even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas, the one person who, according to Acts 9, gave Paul the time of day, the one person who thought Paul was a genuine believer in Jesus. No one else did in the Jerusalem church we read about. And yet even he, even Barnabas, stabbed Paul in the back. Um just as an aside, my own feeling is that that's why Paul and Barnabas actually split. This business in Acts 15 about arguing over John Mark, I think, was the straw that broke the camel's back. But I think it was that clash that really um, put a, a rift between the two of them. So trying to reconcile these big ideas about what God is doing through Christ, what he has done, what he continues to do through Christ at a sort of cosmic level and an ap apocalyptic level, trying to reconcile that with Paul's interactions with Jewish and Gentile believers on the ground and some of the social and emotional explosions that that led to, to me, was you know, to drawing the connections between the two was, was, a, was a fascinating research project. You, you mentioned um, resurrection as a theme throughout. You, you referenced mm. that a little bit earlier. Before we go on to our next kind of question about this, I just want to explore that a little bit. How do you mm. see life coming back from death? throughout the letter. I think that's a very intriguing idea, and I'd lo love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, <laughs> I could really bore you to tears with this, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep my, my, my comments succinct. Um, we haven't found you boring a bit yet. Andy, <laughs> that's nice of you to say so. <laughs> I'll lay um, that out for you. Um, 
I think for Paul, and this this was uh, the idea that I suppose drove my own doctoral research. The the impact of this encounter with the risen Christ, every Pauline scholar will agree that this was the turning point for Paul. This was not just a, a, a sort of emphatic religious experience like the kind he describes in Second Corinthians twelve. This was the moment that Paul discovered why he was on the planet. He he now saw the world through different eyes. I think he reread the the Hebrew Bible differently because of the resurrection. This is a point that Richard Hayes. Uh, formerly of Duke University makes, and I think he's absolutely right. Um, it, it, it was a new hermeneutic lens for Paul. It was a new worldview for Paul. And what I saw in it, and what, what you get in a lot of the scholarship is, yes, for Paul, the resurrection was the vindication of Jesus's ministry. And yes, it tells us a few things about what happens to people after they die. But what isn't given sufficient um, profile, I think, in the scholarship is is how the resurrection actually affects the way that Paul writes and how he argues his cases. Beginning of 2 Corinthians 1, he talks about some incident that happened in Asia and he says that, you know, I felt the sentence of death around my neck. Why did God let this happen? Well, it's so that I wouldn't rely on myself, but on the God who raises the dead. For Paul, the same energy with which God raised Jesus from the dead was how he was going to raise Paul from whatever this disaster was in in uh, in Asia. And I see that all the way through Paul. I certainly see it in Galatians. So he will continually go back to that metaphor because for Paul, this is how God works. This is what this is what God does. He brings the power and energy of life uh, into arenas of death. So when he's talking about his own experience, what is it he says? He says, through the law, I died to the law in order that I might live to God. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And that which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2, 19 through 20. So for Paul, his experience of life was dying and living again. The clearest answer that he gives for his alleged problem with the law. Galatians 3.21, the law cannot make alive. The law can't make a dead thing live. But God through Christ and in the power of the Spirit can. Same thing he says about himself, he says about Gentiles. They, those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh. And if we live by the Spirit, then let us order our steps by the Spirit. Galatians 5. Uh, 24 through 25. Even the cosmos, he says, he says that um, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And now circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing, only new creation. Even the world has been crucified and has now been newly created. For Paul, how Jews are in Christ, how Gentiles are in Christ, and how ultimately the world itself will be resolved and be restored to the original beauty of God's creation is an act of resurrection. It's an act of a dead thing coming to life uh, under the auspices and power of God. So I see this not just as uh, resurrection is not just a thing which happened to Jesus. It's something which is happening through Jesus. And I think this is what Paul is trying to articulate. Uh, I've argued it in Galatians. I'm, one of my next writing projects is to argue the same case in Romans, but I can't think about that now. I've got too much else on my plate, too much marking <laughs> to do. Um, but yeah, that's it's. Uh, I, I think that's uh, it's, it's one of the central motifs in Paul's um, thought and theology. That is a lot to think about. Like just <laughs> as you were like draw, tying all those things together, I just thought about how, yeah, how how we can miss su such central points and how in the way that Paul does see resurrection in the way that you've just laid out is not just in the book of Galatians, but, but throughout all his writings. So when we're, when we're reading scripture and trying to read it from the perspective of it being God's story, putting things right, justice, new creation, tell us more about like how in reading scripture, like through something like this idea of resurrection and Paul's writing, like what are other other ways or other 
other kinds of things that you could you could share with us about either in Galatians or just in scripture, the ways that that seeing God's story through that is mm. present? Yeah, great question. And I, and I think one of the things that's really helped me understand the Bible in a way that I think is more more life affirming and it's more creative is is to see the Bible as as story, as narrative. I think we're very quick to, you know, I, we we hear this phrase, and I and I know what's meant by it. I'm not I'm not trying to be you know just trying to be difficult here, but people often say that oh I put the Bible into practice. I'm often intrigued by what they mean by that. You know, you read the book of Numbers and you put that into practice. I mean, really? I mean, yes, there are commands. There are things that we ought to do. But let's face it, most of the Bible is narrative. It's telling a story. In fact, it's telling a series of stories. And then those stories interconnect and intertwine. I mean, we were talking about uh, uh, Tom Wright and Richard Hayes earlier. These are two biblical scholars who've articulated this very powerfully, that... There is a an overarching story, what's often referred to as its meta narrative, which pretty much begins um, in Genesis and in a garden. And there's a at the end of the mess, there's a flaming sword blocking the the, the garden. And then at, at the end of uh, of Revelation, we we find ourselves that in this you know the New Jerusalem has come down out of out of heaven. And has, has come down to earth, and it's almost like the two halves of the creation are being put back together again. And you know, God's bit and man's bit are kind of back together, just like they were in the garden. And so, this is one long story of restoration and reconciliation, which we see repeated throughout the biblical text. You know, the the the, the Jews are in exile in Babylon, and then they're they're brought back, which interestingly is a story which Ezekiel tells as a resurrection story, right? So this 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 great story of 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 reconciliation of how of how God is is has always purposed to make his creation perfect again. It's not that he tried this through the Jews and they messed up and so Jesus is plan B. Plan A has always been Jesus. Uh, and 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 how that story works out is really what lies at the heart of of, uh, of, of Christian scripture, and, and I think when we when we see that 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 big story, that meta narrative, we're we're far less likely then to just try to sort of dice the Bible up into sort of these bite sized chunks where we can look for things to obey, so to speak. The Bible is not the terms and conditions of church membership. It's not <laughs> a book of dogma and rules. Are there rules? Sure. Is there dogma? It might be a dirty word, but of course there are some things we are dogmatic about. I'm fairly dogmatic about the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. But but far beyond that and far more powerfully and far more immediately, I think, for our lives as Christians is, is this great story. Um, God didn't need to create people. We believe in a triune God, so God could love without people. Again, we can get into that another time. But he created human beings because he wanted to create human beings and he wanted them to be in relationship with him. That kind of went wrong. Again, we can unpack that uh, at some stage if, if we need to. Um, how, how does God put it right? And that really is the key. It's God that's taking the initiative to put it right. He hasn't called upon humans and said, right, fix this in some sort of, like, like the deists believe, you know, God sort of switches the world on, then goes for a coffee while we stand here and and, and try and put the mess back to, back to, together ourselves. He's taken the initiative, and he's done it most emphatically in Jesus. And yet, this story ended up in a crucifixion and a resurrection. How does that fix things? How does how does nailing a Jew to a tree and then seeing him alive a few days later? How does that create correct? The, the, the problem of the dislocation between the relationship between uh, man uh, between God and man that to me is the beautiful story that punctuates the entire biblical text and and the more we get our heads around that story and the the more used to telling that story that we've become, I think the more we realize that it's our story it's our story of brokenness and reconciliation from start to finish. <laughs> 
How much more does that seem like the good news than us telling all the rules of Christianity? Like I mean, if, it, if we could really see it that way, like if we could absorb it that way and share it that way, I mean, just as you were saying that God takes the initiative to put things right. I mean, that is so beautiful and that is good news. And I think in some ways we've lost what the good news is because we, it's easier for us to follow the rules and, and those kind of things. Thank you so much, Andy. That's really helpful, important, encouraging. And, and I think you've hit it on the head. That is, that is the good news. That's the good announcement, which is what, which is what gospel means. The word gospel, of course, it was taken up by the early Christians from a, a sort of a, a Greco-Roman context. When, when the Romans used the Greek term euangelion, which just means good announcement, they were announcing the return of some victorious governor or king from a battle that he'd won. And they'd line the streets. And the good announcement was, you know, the emperor's back or the king is back or this governor's back. So the people would come out and line the streets. And even if they didn't want to, they'd be like sort of cheering him on because that, that was their duty or something. Um, and what the writer of the New Testament was saying, well, look, we've got some good news. The king really is returning. And the, 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 the true king is returning. And he's not returning for a bunch of sort of pomp and circumstance for himself. He's not returning for a big celebration of him and how wonderful he is. He's returning because he values the people. You now, when, when the emperor returned from a battle, he didn't care about the people. Of course, they lined the streets. He was after adulation. But, but, that the great paradox is that the return of the true king ended up in this ghastly death, and then, um, and then you know, victory and resurrection came through that, um, and that's our good news. That's our good announcement that God's like just as Tina said that 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 God's taken the initiative in this way, and and that is a beautiful story. That story, I'll I'll tell that story till I'm blue in the face. That's the story I love to tell. Amen. And I'll amen you all along the way. Um, <laughs> Andy, uh, just to shift gears a little bit, sticking mm -hmm. with, with Galatians, mm -hmm. uh, we've had you know great issues with sectarianism in the Stone Campbell movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have streams that have said, you know, we, we've, we've got the biblical blueprint and pattern down. And for us to have fellowship together, you need to see things as we see things. And, uh, you know, there may be other Christians out there, but I just, you know, I just haven't seen them yet or seen them follow things as carefully and as precisely as we may in our stream of the movement. So there's th this movement that, that launched to kind of combat sectarianism has battled sectarianism within it at yeah. just deep levels. How does mm -hmm. Galatians speak into that and help us move towards just a, a more Christ-centered view of unity? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, one of the important starting points of, for Galatians for me is, as I think I mentioned earlier, this showdown that happened at Antioch. Uh, and it comes off the, the heels of two other quite similar showdowns where a, a group in the church was being marginalized. It starts, I think, even with Paul himself marginalizing the church when he was persecuting them. Then at the beginning of Galatians 2, you have these so-called pseudodelphoi, these false brothers who were trying to bully Paul's Greek co-missionary Titus into being circumcised. And he says, no way, not budging on this. If I do, I will compromise what Paul called the truth of the gospel. It's Galatians 2.5. It comes up again in Galatians 2.14 when he says that Peter wasn't acting in line with the truth of the gospel. When him and the other Jewish believers marginalize the Gentile believers after some colleagues of James turn up. And it's at that moment he actually launches into the first time he talks about justification. The context for justification actually was social exclusion. So in that sense, I do disagree with Luther. I don't think the basis of Galatians is about how does the sinner find a gracious God. That might be somewhere down the line. But rather, it's how do Jewish believers and Gentile believers eat together? That was that was a real question that was at, that was at hand. Um, and so what Paul is trying to explore here, and this is where I think people like James Dunn and, and Tom Wright are, are very helpful, is, is the nature of, of, of Christian family. How do we know what is the people of God and how do we know 
who, who's in it? How do we recognize the people of God? That's one of the key questions, I think, that, that, that um, hovers under the surface of Galatians. Um, and Paul's very clear answer is you recognize the people of God as a people who trust in the Messiahship of Jesus. Um, I would say that part of how Galatians speaks into this is that it offers us a cosmic vision of unity. It, 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 Jesus is described in Galatians 1.4 as the one who delivers us from the age of the present evil. Jesus' goal isn't just to, to, you know, I think things like forgiveness of sins, all of which are related, by the way, but they, they tend to become these kind of buzzwords. But, but really, Jesus' vision is, is, is far broader. It's an apocalyptic vision. Jesus is trying to create the family of God by delivering us from the present age of evil into this, this new place, this new life and this new family. Um, now, that family is not perfect. It's got all kinds of flaws, but we know it's very diverse. We know it embraces all kinds of, uh, of people. And the thing that, that's at the center that's holding us all together is that we trust in this perfect revelation of God, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, uh, uh, Jesus. I think for the, I wouldn't just say it's about the Stone Campbell movement, I'd say it for all kinds of movements, but certainly for the Stone Campbell movement, that's the thing that we have to hold to with tenacity. This, this is the thing that I think Paul is, is, is most vehement about, is that that's, if we hold, if, if the Jews held to circumcision and, and um, the kosher laws and Sabbath as tightly as they held to this central thing, then we're compromising the gospel then then what we're doing is is we're saying that there's a kind of that there's two tiers in the family there's a there's an upper tier of people who hold to, to these jewish customs and a lower tier which is everyone else and that's not that's not that was not the vision of jesus so i think within the stone campbell movement i think we've got to decide really what's the thing we're going to hold to tenaciously and then what hovers around that which ought not to shake us. And, you know, I'm not a Stone Campbell expert by any means, but it seems to me that there are some who hold to, should we have music in our worship, as tightly as they hold to the Messiahship of Jesus. There are some who hold to, should we use one cup or many in, in uh, communion, as tightly as they hold to Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, uh, who, who, who God raised from the dead. If, if you hold on to those things in, in, in the same way, then you've, you've misappropriated the Christian faith. Now, just imagine if we held to God raised Jesus from the dead, and on that basis, he's creating his new family. If that was the only thing we held on to with absolute unflinching tenacity and everything else we could sit around a table and talk about, I don't think we'd have this level of, of sectarianism, the kind of things we divide on. I mean, there are all sorts of these very thorny and um, potentially divisive debates about the role of women, uh, about uh, the nature of leadership, which which are, are rife in, in all churches, in all Christian communities. And I think those debates are crucially important, but they're, to me, they're not, th and unless we stop believing that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, unless we one day wake up and think, oh, maybe he didn't raise Jesus from the dead, then those things are not things to divide over. There are some people in our churches who are strictly uh, complementarian, right? Any women shouldn't be leading anything. Women have this place and they stay in that place. And there are others who are more egalitarian and they think, well, you know, we're cutting off our nose to spite our face, not having women teach and, and women preach. And hold to that tenaciously. I would say, let's discuss those things. They're complex biblical issues. Let's talk about them. But let's not divide over it. The role of women is not something to divide over. It's a crucial debate. But in dividing, we never have the debate. We just all, we all run off into our corners and then we don't have the debate. You know, the debate about racial justice, it's, it's, it's a polarizing debate and it's a difficult conversation. But if we all run off into our corners because 
you know, I think we should be supporting Black Lives Matter, but this person thinks, no, nah, that's, you know, sinful, secular social justice. Then, of course, we run into our corners, we, we label the other group the enemy, and we never have the debate. Then it closes down. Then we don't grow. Then we don't mature. Then we don't, you know, we, we don't have Jesus as our objective, as I, as I mentioned in a, in, in a, in a previous podcast. Um, so I think I think Galatians speaks very powerfully into into Christian sectarianism, but it does so in a way that it takes quite a lot of courage in order to fully embrace what it, it teaches. And I say it takes courage because it will go up against our our sort of the, the tenacity with which we hold to traditions. Uh, and and I'm not saying traditions are inherently bad, but when our traditions become as important as the messiahship of Jesus, then we are, then we're in trouble. Yeah, and we don't get to be part of this family that Jesus died to create. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, that family image, it's used all over um, the New Testament, especially in Paul. Um, Paul sees the church as a household. Um, the reason for that, you know, in, in Ephesians, the relationship between Jesus and church described as a marriage. There's a reason for that. It's because um, every human being, I think, is is wired to be in family, is wired to be in community, even if it's just you and one other person. Um, and and we, we we miss that if we all run off into our, our corners uh, and and you know hold on to our our positions, you know, with this kind of we jealously protect those positions. It, it, it doesn't help us. And, and, it, and it's worse because people think, oh, the tighter I hold to this, the more conviction I have. Well, actually, no, it, it, it's actually the less conviction you have because it, 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 it shows that your, your, your system, your infrastructure collapses without it. Uh, and that, that becomes quite dangerous. Andy, what a great discussion. So much Ooh. more that we could explore on this. And we, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of, uh, you know, I, I, I believe if you're on the same schedule or something similar to where we are here in the States, uh, academically, you may have just finished a semester. I don't know how things are working there, but I think that's probably true. Um, I know you're busy. I know you've got a lot on your plate. And, and Tina and I thank you for just taking the time uh, to have these discussions with us. We'd love to have you back as well. I think we want an agreement from you that you come back sometime and join us again to talk about some other, other you have matters. It. But I want to, uh, want to give you the opportunity. Is there anything, you know, with, with this particular podcast and kind of our goals and aims, anything you'd like to say or share before we get away and then ask you, you know, one more critical question. Uh, well, I mean, the simple thing I'd say is I, I thank God that this podcast exists. Um, I hope that your tentacles reach as far as possible. Uh, and I hope more people take the view that true unity doesn't have to be this unreachable goal, that true unity doesn't mean that we all conform and agree on everything that true unity is so much deeper and so much more powerful than that and and i think how this podcast is is bringing light to that issue is is one of the most life-affirming things i've seen in a long time so keep up the good work and that's not just you know ham-fisted flattery i i genuinely believe that so so keep going and i'll be certainly well thank you brother for that with that much appreciated and uh, again, the book for our listeners is Rethinking Galatians, Paul's Vision of Oneness in the Living Christ. Uh, Dr. Andrew uh, Boachi co-authored that with Peter Oak. So you're looking for authors there, and it's TNT Clark that's the publisher. You can pick that up wherever you buy books. Amazon's got it. Tina, I, I'm going to ask you to close it out and ask uh, Andy our you know very important question, but you might need to reframe it a little bit. Maybe uh, deconstruct it and come back with something uh, uh, new in its place because he's in the UK, uh, born in London and raised there and, and a life there. So it might be a different question about beverages. So you, I'll take give it to you and you take it from there. Okay. So instead of coffee, are we talking about a pint? I'm just kidding. Oh, well, <laughs> I was thinking more tea. 
<laughs> okay, all right, all right. Just to be sure I'm on the same page. No, so uh, the the tagline of um, Common Grounds Unity is unity starts with a cup of coffee. So at the end of our um, podcast, we ask our guests if we were to sit down with you and uh, have a conversation and have a cup of coffee, how would you take it? So is it coffee or maybe tea or something else? Oh, no, it would be coffee. And I like my coffee unadulterated, black no milk, no sugar, just coffee. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a seasoned coffee drinker. So. But not instant coffee, right? Um, I have grown to accept instant coffee the way I accept all sorts of things in life, like Arsenal supporters and you know, all sorts of things. Um, but, um, but ideally, fresh coffee. Uh-huh, yes, ideally perfect. Fresh coffee. Good. Well, hopefully one day we will get to sit down and have a cup of coffee with I you. I really hope we can. Andy, thank you so, so much for being with us. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you at the next episode. And in the meantime, get together with someone who's uh, in a maybe in a deconstructing, reconstructing phase or someone that's outside of your particular group of churches and um, start having a conversation over a cup of coffee. Thank you for listening to the Common Grounds Unity podcast. Please check out commongroundsunity.org to learn more about who we are. You can subscribe to the essays, join our Facebook group, or find our YouTube channel. And please check out the gatherings page where you can connect with other unity-minded Christians in your area. If you can't find a gathering in your area, we can help you start one. It's not difficult or time-consuming, and we'll help you out along the way. It really does simply start with a cup of coffee. If you want to volunteer or ask questions, please email john at commongroundsunity.org. And lastly, we need your help by donating to this ministry of reconciliation. Your donation is tax deductible. Links for donating are in the show notes or on our website. Until next time, God bless. And remember, unity starts with a cup of coffee.